Sometimes I relax just by floating around in space. Jealous much? I thought so. But there are people who actually do come out into space. We call those people astronauts. Terra firma. Gotta love gravity. Now those astronauts that are out in space, whether it be a space station or a space shuttle, have to concern themselves with a multitude of factors. But one of those things is, do I have enough oxygen to breathe? And the other one is, what happens to all the carbon dioxide that I breathe out? Because if those carbon dioxide levels get too high, the astronauts could risk passing out or maybe even dying. So that raises an interesting question. Hmm. Big surprise, I'm going to talk about cookies. More specifically, I'm going to talk about Oreo cookies, you know, the chocolate wafers and the creamy filling. Let's say we were to put together a chemical reaction, or a set of instructions, or a recipe if you like, for putting together an Oreo cookie. You would have to have two chocolate wafers and one creamy filling to give you one cookie. Now, let's say that you were in an Oreo factory and you had to put together a number of cookies and you were given uh, eight pieces of wafer and you were given five creamy fillings. If we were to just take a look at the numbers, you would suspect that you would run out of creamy fillings first because five is less than eight. But you understand that for each cookie, you need two chocolate wafers and only one creamy filling. So in actuality, you're going to run out of chocolate wafers first. And it doesn't matter how many creamy fillings you have, uh, it just is going to limit the number of complete Oreo cookies you can make. Now, this is analogous to something in chemistry that we refer to as the limiting reagent. That is, the substance that's going to run out first. Because in a chemical reaction, if we have two or more reactants, and we have specific amounts of these reactants, if one of the reactants gets used up first, it doesn't matter how much of the other reactant we have, the reaction is not going to proceed. Similarly, as I discussed, if we run out of chocolate wafers, you could have all of the creamy filling in the world and you're not going to be able to make more complete Oreo cookies. So the limiting reagent in a chemical reaction, or sometimes referred to as the limiting reactant, is the thing that gets completely used up first through the process of a chemical reaction. The other reactant, or reactants, is something that we refer to as the excess reactant, or excess reagent. And that is the substance, the reactant, that's left over after the limiting reactant has been completely used up. So if we want to look at it another way, the limiting reactant, or the limiting reagent, is what determines how much product can be produced. It's almost kind of like the weak link in that process. Now before we move on, it is important to note that you can have both reactants, or all of the reactants, being the limiting reactant. That is, you can have correct stoichiometric ratios that match the balanced chemical equation that give you both values being limiting. Alternatively, you could have two limiting reactants if there were three and so on and so forth. But for most of our purposes, we're just going to take a look at a scenario where we have two reactants or two reagents. One of them is going to be limiting and the other one is going to be excess. So the limiting reagent and excess reagent really just add one more layer to our stoichiometric problems. That is, rather than just having one reactant, we are li now likely to have two or more reactants and we have to figure out which one's going to dictate or determine how much product is produced. So if you remember quickly, we have our reactants and typically we'll have the mass of a reactant which we'll then have to use the molar mass to convert into moles. We then use our mole ratio to establish the number of moles of product that are going to be produced and then again using the molar mass, we're going to figure out the mass of product that we should expect. Now with limiting reagents, we're adding one more layer to really our first calculation because we have two masses now of reactants. So what we have to do is establish which one of those two is going to be the limiting reagent or the limiting reactant in our process. And that one is the molar value that we're then going to use to complete our calculation. So let's take a look at a sample chemical reaction, a balanced chemical equation that we can then evaluate using limiting reagent and limiting reactant calculations. And we can then see what the different layers and different processes are to approach a question like this. 
First, before we get started, we have to identify when to perform a limiting reagent calculation as opposed to just a standard stoichiometric calculation. And really the answer to that is, if you have enough information to calculate the number of moles that you have for both reactants. Typically in textbooks or problems that you're going to come across, if there isn't a limiting reagent question or if it isn't a limiting reagent problem, it will typically give you the mass of one reactant and say that the other one is in excess, indicating that the mass of the reactant that you have is already the limiting reagent. But if you don't have that scenario, if you're given the mass of both reactants or you have sufficient information to figure out the number of moles of both reactants, we're going to have to drop a game plan that involves limiting reagents and limiting reactants. So let's take a look at what we have here. So the game plan or the setup for these is really no different than the standard stoichiometric problems that we faced so far. We're going to be given a mass of our reactant, we're going to use the molar mass of the formula, and it's important to note here that we do not use the coefficients to figure out molar mass, and that's going to allow us to figure out the number of moles of our reactant. Now if we were told that this was the limiting reagent or that the other reactant was in excess, we could continue from here. But we're going to assume that we're given the mass of both reactants and we now have to establish which one is limiting. So we can now calculate the number of moles of both reactants and that's really just our first calculation here. This is where it differs from our stoichiometric calculations previously. With a stoichiometric calculation we would typically move on to the mole ratio and try and find the number of moles of the product we're looking for. Here we have to first establish which one is limiting, that is which one's going to dictate how much product is produced. So we have to undergo a calculation that's going to allow us to figure out the limiting reagent. So our second calculation is going to involve something that we like to call the boss method, which determines which one of these two is the boss. That is, which one of these two is going to determine how much product is produced. So what we do is we divide by the coefficient representing each reactant in the balanced chemical equation. For, so for aluminum nitrate, that will be 2, and for the sulfuric acid, that will be 3. Whichever of the two values is lower is our limiting reagent. And the important thing about this is once we establish what the limiting reagent is, we never use this calculation again. So if we were to establish that aluminum nitrate was the limiting reagent, we would use the number of moles of aluminum nitrate from our first calculation to do our mole ratio. And if we were to determine that sulfuric acid was our limiting reagent, we would use the number of moles from our first calculation in our mole ratio. So once we establish our limiting reagent, the process is the same as any other stoichiometric problem. We're going to use our mole ratio as part of our third calculation to figure out the number of moles of product that we're going to produce, and then we're going to use the molar mass of that and ultimately figure out the mass. So this really just adds one more element, and that is figuring out which one is going to dictate how much product is produced in this reaction. Now, I'm not going to leave you hanging. Let's get back to our astronauts. Now, like you and I, astronauts have to breathe. They take in oxygen and through the processes of cellular respiration, one of the waste products that comes about is carbon dioxide. Now if these carbon dioxide levels get too high in an enclosed space, like a space shuttle or a space station, there is the potential for the astronaut to pass out and even die. So how do they ensure that this doesn't happen? Well, they use scrubbers that contain a compound of lithium hydroxide. And this lithium hydroxide combines with carbon dioxide to produce lithium carbonate in solution and water. Now, as you can imagine, they want to make sure that the lithium hydroxide is not the limiting reagent in these trips, because if it runs out first, we have excess carbon dioxide being built up. So astronauts and those designing shuttle missions are very conscious of limiting reagent calculations. And hopefully after watching this video, you will be too. Thanks for watching. Did you like this video? Did you not like the video? Was there something that seemed like it was a little off? Well, either way, we want to hear about it. So like us or leave a comment in the section below as to things that we could change or improve. And if you want to see more videos like this, you can subscribe to our channel on YouTube or follow us on Twitter.